Hey everyone, thanks for joining our Tech Talk today. We will get started shortly. Let's just wait uh, one or two minutes for folks to get off their previous meetings and log on, and then we'll get started. Again, thanks for joining. Hey everyone, we'll get started shortly. Just waiting uh, half a minute for folks to log on here and we'll get going. Okay, well, hi and welcome everyone to today's Tech Talk. My name is Kevin and I'll be the moderator for today. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and all participants will be muted for the duration. And so if you have a question, right, so please send them through the Q&A portion of the GoToWebinar tool. And today we have Venkat Venkataramani with us. So Venkat is the CEO and co-founder of Rockset. Uh, we've asked him to share his thoughts around why you shouldn't be building apps on data warehouses today, so I'll let him tell you a bit more about himself and the topic. So Venkat, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Kevin. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes, awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate uh, you attending this. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics to go over. My name is Venkat. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rockset. Rockset is a real-time database in the cloud. And so we often work with uh, customers building large scale data applications. And one question that keeps coming up all the time is, why shouldn't I just build my large scale data application on my data warehouse? And so I just thought uh, I'll compile uh, the usual uh, you know, questions and discussions that come around this topic and, and share it with you all in this tech talk. Just a little bit about myself before um, we uh, get started. Um, prior to founding Rockset, I was managing online data infrastructure at Facebook. Um, all Facebook's user-facing products um, that, you know, by 2015 had about a billion, 1.5 billion users. Um, all of those user-facing products were built on top of the online data infrastructure that my team was responsible for. Uh, by the time I left in 2015, these systems were collectively serving more than 5 billion queries a second. So uh, you know, we've done, uh, have had, uh, been very fortunate uh, building massive scale data applications within the boundaries of Facebook. And now with Rockset, we're enabling that in the public clouds. And prior to that, I was at Oracle building databases after my master's in Wisconsin. Go Badgers. All right, um, just a quick agenda. I wanna kind of first take a minute and you know, describe what is a application, what is a data application? Uh, what category are we talking about here? Just so that we're all on the same page and give you some examples of uh, what I really mean by an application or what are the kind of applications that people would consider, uh, you know, perhaps building on a data warehouse. And then we'll talk a little bit about the disconnect between the application's needs and what data warehouses generally offer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Rockset and then go into the seven reasons that comes up all the time um on that th th those are all the reasons why you should not do this cool let's keep without further ado um what is an app what is a data app you know if you're building an application you know a web app a mobile app where you know have a, some client stack you have a, a couple of api servers app servers and then you have you know all, you can store all your data in a single node mysql single node postgres like first of all, congratulations. Uh, you are a fortunate few. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need a warehouse. You don't need Rockset. You don't need anything. Uh, MySQL and Postgres are amazing databases. Just use them. Uh, you know, call your mom and say your life is great. Uh, you don't. You don't need. Uh, you don't need anything fancy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 
you know, it, like the rest of the talk is not going to be relevant for you at all. But if you are in the, you know, the few that for whatever reason is not able to build your application on a single node MySQL, single node Postgres, well, then this talk is for you. Uh, that is what we deal with at Rockset day in and day out. And that's where uh, all these discussions are, are relevant. So what is what are these new modern applications look like? And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, you know, say you are building a real-time supply chain backend, uh, you know, a platform in the cloud for, for heavy construction. You know, if you can think of UPS and FedEx tracking, you know, uh, deliveries and boxes like you know uh, along the entire uh, delivery chain, uh, this company is trying to track concrete trucks driving around for, you know, large construction sites. You know, thousands and thousands of these trucks uh, for every construction site. You know, they're tracking that uh, in real time, and you know, 80 percent of concrete poured in the U.S. is tracked through the system. And now, you know, you built a really modern uh, cloud architecture with DynamoDB, uh, and everything is serverless. Everything is wonderful until you have to now build some real-time reporting and real-time analytics uh, on this data, where you have hundreds of millions of job tickets uh, that are getting updated all the time. So if you kind of think about, okay, what would I need to do? Clearly a single node MySQL or Postgres is not gonna be enough, right? And, and this is a, a classic example of a modern data application that does not fit in the simple mold that we just looked at in the previous slide here. So if you kind of like zoom out a little bit, why is this hard? Uh, because these applications are you know, demanding both speed and scale simultaneously. Right. Um, you know, it needs to be fast. It needs to be as fast as an application that, you know, that, you know, that can be built on a single node MySQL or Postgres. But unfortunately, the volume of data, the volume of writes, the complexity of the queries in terms of joins and aggregations and what have you, all of those scale up. And so you need both scale, but at the same time without compromising speed. But the existing solutions, you know. There are only two kinds of databases in the world, uh, transactional databases, which gives you speed, but the minute you need to scale, as I said, data volume or the number of writes or the complexity of the queries and, and compute, uh, you need to scale compute, all of that becomes extremely hard. And so if you were to try to use some sharded MySQL, Postgres, whatever, you know, good luck, um, you know, you know get ready to hire a, a large devops and data ops team and, and dbas and look forward to writing their performance review every six months right so it's not an easy uh task at all and you have to you cannot take this decision lightly on the flip side there are data warehouses and this is why this topic is even relevant today because well they do give you scalability uh you know i can just put a lot of data on a warehouse it'll just happily take it all but should I build my compute heavy applications on it? Well, you're gonna, uh, the, the classic uh, dilemma here is that, you know, if you pick scale and then you end up choosing a, a data warehouse, you're just gonna have a very slow application and it's gonna be very, very expensive uh, in terms of compute costs exploding on you. Uh, and it may still be slow. And if you wanted to get, get anywhere close to the speed that your, your uh, end users expect, uh, it would become prohibitively expensive. So let's dissect this a little bit more, right? What kind of applications are we talking about here, right? Um, there are largely like four different categories that comes up in a lot of our conversations. So I just thought I would talk a little bit about them. Search apps are a, are a classic thing. You know, we don't mean here uh, natural language text search or keyword search. We're talking about structured search. Say you have, uh, you know, users or products or entities that has you know 30 40 50 different fields uh, and um, you want to be able to search by any of those fields it's still a structured search uh, all those fields are still typed and you want to do sometimes range queries and sometimes you know equality queries and whatnot but OLTP systems can't really scale again not just when the data volume gets higher but also you know you don't want to really a, a you know a single MySQL or Postgres table or OLTP on you know, your OLTP database with like 30, 40 secondary indexes, then your writes will be prohibitively expensive and um, it's just not a, a scalable architecture. So large scale search apps is one category here of, of this example. 
uh, analytical apps is another uh, example where you know a gaming leaderboard is a, is a classic example of an analytical app where uh, you're really trying to do a show uh, you know top 10 and you still want to basically allow your you know end users to slice and dice the data in you know and, and show an interactive analytics and not just pre-canned set of reports that you're showing ahead of time that is uh, built offline and and uh, on, on a periodic basis and you want the interactivity on your analytics as uh, in terms of query performance and again uh, analytics you know without distributed sql it's very very hard to build that on a single node MySQL or Postgres, and this is why I think you start thinking about, oh, maybe I need a warehouse. Uh, the third one is add on top of that analytical application data freshness needs. Uh, Real-time fleet management, um, some, you know, example I just gave is a, is a really good example where it has all the complexity of an analytical app plus the data has to be fresh. Uh, you know, if the data is, com is coming uh, behind, um, is, is, you know, even if it's 30 minutes behind, it's really not useful at all because you want to know what's happening right now. And so again, uh, here, if you think about it, both transactional databases and warehouses really struggle to keep keep up with the, the incoming volume, like huge data volumes, um, and, and still provide uh, you know, efficient analytics on top of that. And last but not least, um, there's a classic kind of big data apps where it's just the data volume is is quite high, and you don't really have uh, you you may you don't have a real time need, but the the data volumes are going in like multi terabytes, maybe tens of terabytes. Um, there's this example of an investment in the Insights platform where um, it's a you know think of a hedge fund where they're generating a golden data set every night after extensive ETL from hundreds of different data sources that they get. And they want to put that like multi terabyte data set in the hands of every analyst, every investor in the in, you know inside the hedge fund company, and they want interactive, very very fast interactive ad hoc uh, analytics on that, and you know and you have to but reload the data like every six hours or twelve hours whenever they have a, a new data set being generated, and again here you need um, uh, you know here is another you know category of application where you know. OLTP systems uh, aren't suited well, and then start people start thinking about maybe I need a warehouse, maybe I should just build this on um, a data warehouse. So let's let's double kick this a little bit more into the disconnect, right? So we touched upon a little bit at a high level, and I will spend some time kind of thinking about you know what's a warehouse and what are the needs of an application, and so. If you think about a warehouse is really a, a freight train. They're amazing, you know, for moving large volumes of, uh, you know, goods from one place to another, but they are not really, you know, built for speed, right? Uh, and built for uh, even scaling and, and moving. And what you really need for applications is is a maglev, right? You need extremely fast passenger trains that can carry people as opposed to goods. Uh, and this is the best analogy I could come up with on why there is a fundamental disconnect you know from a technical standpoint it really comes down to these three things if you think about you know data warehouses the architecture and everything is built you know from columnar compression uh the more modern uh, cloud data warehouses separating storage from compute um you know all of those things really comes down to really one thing which is uh they're storage optimized Right. If you want to accumulate huge volumes of data, and occasionally an analyst would want to come and generate a report on that on that data set, then if you think about you know especially in the cloud, what are you paying for 24/7, and what are you paying for only when there's an occasional use? It's storage that you're paying 24/7, and compute comes and goes. So when you do have that uh, situation, then it does make sense to optimize and compress and and reduce your storage footprint as much as possible at the expense of the compute probably being more expensive but because you're you know shutting it down when you don't need it it actually works out to be uh, generally beneficial for batch analytics and even data load happens that way you don't want to be running uh, compute on a warehouse even to load data continuously because that gets prohibitively expensive very very quickly uh, you don't want to spin up a lot of compute to you know, insert like 10 rows uh, every second or something like that, or, you know, or even millions of rows. It just gets, uh, again, very, very expensive for both reads and writes. So 
So really, if you're using a data warehouse and batch analytics, and you have a, a, a the compute power, uh, you know aspect of that running 24/7, then you really have an application and not batch analytics needs. Then you should think again, right? But if you think about what applications need, well, applications don't have an off button, right? You can't really turn this thing off, uh, you know, because you know your analysts are, you know. Uh, you know, don't work on weekends, so you can just kind of like completely shut this down on, on, a, on, a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. No, it doesn't work that work like that, right? Um, applications don't have an off button. The queries never stop coming. You want predictable performance no matter what time of the day your users are using your application. And so what that really means is that you will have to be spinning compute and storage 24-7 to power an application. And anybody, you know, who's been in the industry would know that Compute in terms of compute processing power and memory and everything that comes along with compute is orders of magnitude more expensive than storage, right? Just think about think about uh, you know a running EC2 uh, a powerful EC2 machine you know for a month uh, versus having you know let's say two terabytes of data sitting in S3 for a month. You'd know that you know just simple economics you know tells you that you know compute is way, way, way more expensive than storage, um, and even more so uh, in the cloud. And so for applications, fundamentally, what you need is your data backend needs to be compute optimized, not storage optimized. It's okay if the storage is even slightly uh, not as compressed. Uh, you build a bunch of indexes that kind of like adds a little bit of a bloat, uh, as long as the indexes allow you save enough on the compute expense, they are worth it. They will pay for themselves many times over every month. Uh, and so that's the fundamental disconnect here that you need a compute optimized system, not a storage optimized system. On top of that, imagine a real time application where data never stops coming. Now, if you go to a warehouse, you get a double whammy. You are spinning a whole bunch of compute to be constantly writing to your warehouse, compressing it and 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 compacting it, and then on the other side, you're also spending a, a, a you know tremendous amount of uh, you know uh, compute to be powering your queries, and both of them are extremely expensive uh, in a system that is not optimized for compute. So again, you know if you have a real-time application, you have twice as many reasons uh, you know uh, to 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 not uh, use a storage optimized system. But really going after a compute optimized system. Um, cool. Um, I'm really eager to get uh, you know some of your questions uh, around this topic. So if you have a question, please leave uh, in the questions uh, prompt here, and we will cover that at the end of the talk. But I hope this makes sense um, on on what the fundamental disconnect between warehouses and applications needs are. And you know why? Why you know how do we? Why are we talking about this? Right? Why is the? How is this relevant to Rockset? Rockset is fundamentally built from scratch in the cloud to break this dilemma. How can applications get both speed and scale simultaneously, uh, even when the data sets are getting larger and you still want subsequent query performance time? So how does it work? Um, you know, Rockset is a real-time indexing database for these large-scale uh, data applications that you should be able to build you know, without any operational overhead. Uh, so how does it work? Um, in order to use Rockset, you create an account with Rockset and you just simply point Rockset at wherever your data is living, whether it is a data stream, you know, Kafka Kinesis, or your data is sitting in a data lake, S3, or a warehouse, and you want to build an application on top of that data, or the data is actually being actively maintained uh, in a system of record like a transactional database. Just create an account with Rockset, point us, point Rockset at wherever your data is living. What Rockset will do is in real time, Rockset will replicate the data from any of those sources into Rockset. And in real time, it will index every row, every column as the data comes in uh, within one to two seconds. And will automatically turn your data sets into fully typed, fully indexed SQL tables in the cloud. And so you can instantly start building applications simply using SQL. 
So if you think about uh, even some of the sources being semi-structured, no problem, Rockset's ingestion is schema-less. So you may have JSON data coming through a Kafka topic, uh, you may have Parquet data sitting in a data lake, and you may have MongoDB as your operational database, no problem whatsoever. Each of those data sources can be uh, in real time synced with Rockset, and Rockset comes with built-in data connectors. Uh, so if you uh, use MySQL, Postgres, Mongo uh, as an operational database, Kafka or Kinesis as your data stream, or you're using S3 or GCS uh, as your uh, data lake, we already have built-in connectors, so you really don't have to write a single line of code to make a real-time replica of your data sets in these places into a fully indexed, fully typed SQL table uh, maintained in, in Rockset in the cloud. So, you know, now, as you can imagine, I, you know, if you're interested in this, we, you know, you know, ping us and we'd love to show your demo and things like that. I don't wanna, um, I wanna get back to the topic at hand, which is really how is this relevant? It's like now you can actually build an application in hours or not weeks and not just, I'll say something even stronger, that once you build these large-scale data applications on Rockset, you will never build one on a data warehouse. So uh, give it a shot. Uh, I will have some pointers at the end if you're interested. And you don't have to take my word for it. Here is a, a real example. The first, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I gave you an example of a, a real-time supply chain. Uh, it was a very specific example. You may have been wondering. Yes, they are a, a customer, and um, they are a, a huge. Um, um, they, their entire platform is built on DynamoDB, and they are uh, um, they, they have already done all the you know they use DynamoDB as a system of record. All the hundreds of millions of job tickets are being tracked in DynamoDB in real time. But they did want to build very advanced real time reporting and interactive analytics on top of the data, and they were able to build their app in a, you know in a matter of days, and were able to take it to production in a matter of weeks. So that is a real use case. Uh, you know, if you're interested, there's a case study on it uh, that's you know, you know right now available on our website. So what are the reasons? So if you kind of like think about the fundamental disconnect, but in terms of an application, what are usually the application requirements that you know gets in the way when you start trying to build it on top of a warehouse? So first and foremost is query performance, right? Um, Warehouses are not built to run, you know, hundreds of 10 millisecond queries or 100 millisecond queries. Warehouses are built for running a small number of really, really large queries, right? Uh, you know, as I said, they're, they're, they're warehouses are freight trains and not commuter trains. And, you know, you're not really trying to reduce the, uh, the time of a single query. You're trying to, you know, uh, increase the throughput of a query that runs for 20 minutes or two hours or what have you. And so when interactivity of your application is important, when somebody comes into your application, they are typing something in a text box, they are doing ad hoc filtering, slicing, dicing, aggregation sorts, you, and you want subsequent response times, well then you shouldn't be building that application on a warehouse. Why? Because at the end of the day, to make those queries faster, you need indexes. And data warehouses, uh, do not support any indexing because fundamentally data warehouses are uh, very good at you know data that is either immutable or very rarely uh, changed, and so indexes will require you know fundamentally data mutations uh, in the underlying uh, storage system, which warehouses just do not support. And so this would be probably one of the the most common thing that comes up. Um, I think uh, there are lots of systems that, you know, the data warehouses, you know, uh, every query is actually considered a job. Uh, the time it takes to even fire up all the compute needed to process that query uh, or quote unquote job in a warehouse usually runs in like anywhere from 500 milliseconds to one to two seconds. Uh, but you need a system that can do distributed SQL where, uh, you know, for example, in Rockset, the time it takes to compile a query and fire off a distributed execution of that uh, is about 1.2 milliseconds. And so you need the power of distributed SQL, but you also need to be able to do that extremely fast um, so that the applications that are built uh, on top of that uh, are, are fast and interactive and delights your users. 
High, higher concurrency. Uh, this is the second thing that comes up a lot. Okay, a single query is fast enough, or maybe it's okay, but what happens when a lot of my users start using my application at the same time? Well, again, uh, you know, the real risk of building this in a warehouse is not about just what performance, but about the explosion of compute costs, right? Uh, for most warehouses, when you go from one concurrent query uh, to 100, your compute costs will literally grow by 100x. There are no indexes, there are no shortcuts to be able to lean it sub, you know, scale it sublinearly. Uh, so it is something that is uh, a, a big concern when the minute you go into higher concurrency, you do not want to be building on top of a warehouse because you go from not just having a, a production sev where you know you are um, engineering and SRE teams are all uh, scrambling to figure out what what is going on and how to make it work, but at the simultaneously you are giving a heart attack to your CFO. Uh, who is going to be like waiting for a shock of their life when there is a sudden spike in application usage and you are 10 to 100xing your compute costs and you really don't want to be uh, you know creating that kind of a, a risk uh, you know for your company and for your application. Third, data latency. Uh, this is data freshness like the time it takes for new data to be created to when you know your application can access it you know via by querying a system Again, real-time ingest is uh, generally data warehouses suffer from this a lot because all of their efficiencies come from being able to do better compression. And all of the most of the compression technologies they use only work when you do batch writes. So you can take all the new data that needs to be written or appended to a table, compress it, and then uh, plop it in. And if you trickle it one row at a time or five rows at a time, it usually defeats the purpose. And it takes a system that is already compute inefficient and makes it 10 times more so. So you, if you don't get uh, as much compression, and a lot of these warehouses are columnar uh, oriented, which means they have to scan the entire column or a portion of the column to, uh, to process every query. And if you start trickling data in in real time and expect sub-second or sub-minute um, uh, you know, data freshness uh, and data lags, uh, it is very, very difficult. Uh, if not prohibitively expensive, uh, it's either impossible or, or prohibitively expensive for you to be able to build real-time applications on warehouses. So I do not recommend that. And la you know, the fourth one is around the shape of your data. So we talked about query performance and query uh, concurrency. We talked about data latency, data freshness, but there's also a very important thing around the shape of your data. So again, if you go and look down at how warehouses organize the data and why they get to be so storage efficient, is it goes back to compression. Now, semi-structured data oftentimes don't have schema defined ahead of time. It just looks like you know, nested arrays of nested objects of nested arrays and on and on. Um, columnar compression and most of columnar databases, columnar data warehouses, uh, compression technologies don't work when uh, you don't have any structure and uh, the types cannot be hoisted and uh, once the types cannot be hoisted uh, a lot of the columnar compression uh, just does not work well so then you know these databases just default to just storing data as JSON itself or as some kind of a, a semi-structured format in one column and they usually call it like a JSON data type or something like that and then what happens well at query time now, if you want to access some field inside one of those JSON blobs, well, now you're scanning 100x more, uh, you know, more data uh, to be able to process those queries, which makes your compute, again, it's already inefficient. Now, again, just to query that, make that one query, it's 100 times more inefficient and 100 times more expensive thereby. And so the, scan, the scanning becomes very, very inefficient if you don't have structure. And uh, and uh, you know uh, that is that is one thing. And if you really want again efficient, uh, compute efficient query processing on semi-structured data, you need indexes. Without that, you really can't go far. And you need very advanced indexing capabilities that on semi-structured data beyond what you know typical uh, indexing techniques uh, you know are available on a, on a structured uh, SQL database. And so. Rockset uses this thing called converged indexing, 
uh, we've written you know made videos about it we've written a white paper about this so i i for those of you interested in how conversion indexing works in rockset i uh, i invite you to go and uh, check out those content again it's available on our uh, rockset.com blog and so it's really uh, you know again if you have a, a lot of uh, semi-structured data you know either because you're using mongo dynamodb kind of like NoSQL uh, transactional systems it's very common uh, that this you run into this situation you could be using kafka or kinesis and you have json event streams coming in real time where new fields can appear out of thin air and without any advanced warning uh, which is a very normal thing for uh, for real time streams and also you may be sitting on a lot of parquet or json data on s3 on your data lake um, on which you want you might want to build an application and for all of these uh, in all of these situations again uh, you really need a, a system that allows for data indexing on semi structured data for your application to be compute efficient and scalable and let's quickly talk about data mutability um, so we talked about you know different data sources uh, but some of them actually uh, you know on a data lake for example and data on even streams usually they're append only uh, right you, you you create more data and you load more data into the system but what if your data source is an upstream OLTP database what if it's MongoDB uh, MySQL Postgres DynamoDB uh, like DynamoDB example that we saw in the real-time fleet management example well uh, you're not only inserting records you're also updating records in, you know in the in the in that system of record you're also uh, deleting them you know sometimes and so if your analytics or your application needs uh, to not just work on the data, but maybe join your event stream with the dimension tables coming out of your OLTP system, right? Say you have clickstream logs coming or, or search logs coming from the event stream, but you still have users and orders and other uh, you know important um, uh, tables coming from your uh, system of record and your application needs to join both of them to to get uh, to you know for for uh, for functioning then you really need something a system that uh, supports data mutability and warehouses don't and so it is another reason why a system a real-time database like Rockset, which supports mutability where every field every row is mutable with advanced kind of patch APS support um, and uh, and upserts and inserts and everything you really need a, a, a way to be able to you know, handle that efficiently to be able to build an application where uh, some of the data sources could be changing in real time, not just, uh, you know, uh, you know and, and they're coming from you know, OLTP systems. Another manifestation of the same problem happens when you work with event streams. You know, a lot of people think event streams are append only, but uh, you know, but imagine uh, with every event stream, you have to handle out of order arrivals and very, very late arrivals. And what invariably it ends up being is, again, if you had already compressed those uh, historical segments because you think that you've sealed it and, and, and now you can go and columnar compress and, and build all of that in a, in a data warehouse, uh, again, in an event stream, you have a very similar problem where without, you know, if your underlying system does not support mutations, it's very hard or impossible to handle out of order events and late arrivals. And it's a very similar problem where, again, I think the, the fundamental disconnect there is that the applications are demanding data mutability, uh, but the warehouses don't offer that. And so, again, uh, if mutability matters, then don't pick a warehouse. Um, another interesting thing is to think about scale of your, you know, the size of your data sets uh, that your application really needs. Um, you may be having petabytes of data on your data lake or your data warehouse, but the portion of the data that you really need to be able to, uh, you know, that your application really needs might be orders of magnitude smaller, right? And so it's really uh, worth it to think deeply about it and say, well, you know, I do have, I am sitting on historical data that runs in petabytes, but my application only needs the last seven days, or my application only needs the aggregated data across this large time frame, and not the raw data. You know, so the low quality raw data can live in a data lake and it can live in a warehouse, but the high quality aggregated data, the high quality recent data, you know, it usually runs in you know hundreds of gigabytes or hundreds of terabytes in most installations, even if they are 
data lake footprint and their data warehouse footprint runs in you know many many ter in many many petabytes right and so when you think about now in this application space when you are thinking about the volume is in hundreds of gigs to hundreds of terabytes you should really think about picking a different space time trade off right uh, so instead of spending you know in this example $500 on your storage and say you have you know 10 terabytes of data 20 terabytes of data and then end up spending you know 40k on compute uh, you know it is actually worth it to bump up your storage cost by building more indexes uh, by bringing the data and keeping it in hot storage instead of cold storage if it's going to pay for itself and allow you to reduce the compute cost significantly and so a deeper analysis uh, of your application scale needs and what's a, a better storage to compute spend ratio uh, you know have a you know kind of really trade uh, space for time because oftentimes it has a chance of cutting your overall cost of your of your system by anywhere from two to four x uh, and which is what we typically see when an application moves from a data warehouse uh, to a system like Rockset. All right, last but not least, um, applications, you know, you also have to think about the lifecycle management of, of your application, right? How do you unit test your application? How do you make sure the next release is not gonna break uh, any of the existing functionality? Uh, how can you do CI CD integration? Um, and, um, and how do you, you know, how do you make sure that you can continue to move fast and iterate on your application without breaking production and having saves all the time. And so, um, the you know these are this whole workflow of of how to build applications and how to integrate that uh, you know with your dev you know uh, with your dev environment and dev and uh, CI/CD pipelines is not something that warehouses are very very good at. Um, you often find a, a whole lack of tools and integration um, and um and and at rockset we have this interesting concept of a query lambda uh which is a great example of of a of a, of a function of a, of a feature or a function that will allow you uh to integrate uh your application uh you know you know rockset's backend with your application's uh developer lifecycle uh what is a query lambda it's a it's a named parameterized sql query that is turned into a, a rest endpoint uh, at a click of a button. So as far as your application is concerned, it's just working with a REST kind of microservice where you send JSON parameters and you get JSON response back. But behind the scenes, when the REST endpoint is hit, it substitutes the incoming parameters into a, a SQL parameter, which is on a saved SQL query, and, and send, gives you the responses back. Now, these query lambdas are fully versioned. Uh, you know and they are taggable and so it's very very easy to integrate uh you know create new versions without breaking production uh and integrate the the updating the tag of what is a, a developer uh, what what is the master version what is the production version um, and what's going through staging and qa and it's very very easy to integrate and automate the entire workflow so uh, this is just one another uh domain of of reasons why um, you know, you 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 really need uh, you know an applications backend that understands that what it's serving or applications are not analysts and and uh, provides you all the functionality required uh, to make sure you know your pushes your application changes are safe and can be done without causing any any downtime. Cool. Um, that's all I have. Um, I love to take more questions, but you know, just if you think about, um, you know, the future that we are living in where these applications are demanding both uh, speed and scale simultaneously, you need to think beyond uh, what a, a single node OLTP database can do. You need to think about, you need to think beyond, can I just abuse my data warehouse to get my app going? Uh, especially in the cloud, uh, you know, this can be achieved. Speed and scale can be simultaneously achieved on, a real-time database that is massively scalable and can allow you to build your applications in a matter of minutes to days as opposed to months to quarters. Uh, if you're more interested, uh, check us out. There's a $300 free trial. Uh, you can request a demo. Uh, you know, 
um, you can talk to some of the most friendly and amazing people at Rockset. Uh, uh, they would be more than happy to show you a demo if you're interested. Uh, you know, there's also a $300 free trial credit. So give, you know, go spin the wheels, give it a, give it a shot, uh, and and let us know what you think. And uh, I'm curious to uh, hear back from you all. Hey. Uh, we, we also have a, a tech talk coming up. Um, uh, if you're interested to uh, understand more, uh, our CPO Shruti uh, is doing another deep dive on uh, how Rockset, uh, you know, integrates and works with Snowflake and how you can get the best batch analytics system along with the best real-time system uh, in the cloud. So if this is uh, interesting for you, uh, please, um, you know, sign up for the follow-up talk. Uh, it's coming up next month. Sounds Thank good, Venkat. Okay, so thanks, Venkat. Uh, thanks for sharing all your thoughts, recommendations. This was great. Uh, we'll take some questions shortly. So if there's anything on your mind you want to ask, you can find the question section of the webinar tool, uh, enter your question there, and we'll get to that shortly. As Venkat mentioned, he talked about a lot of resources on our uh, website. This is our homepage right here. You can request to meet with us. You can get a Rockset account instantly, right, when you when you sign up. Uh, and you can also check out all the, all the blogs, recordings, and register for next month's webinar as well, where we talk about uh, indexing of Snowflake data and how that would work. So avail yourself of that opportunity as well. And feel free to contact, you know, Venka venkat at rockset.com, kevin at rockset.com if you want to find us after this event. And let's get to some questions, Venkat. All right. So uh, here's one. How do these recommendations for building apps apply to cloud versus on-prem? Any thoughts on that? Oh, a good question. So yeah, data warehouses are not new in the cloud. Um, uh, I think data warehouses have been there for a long time. Um, I would say if you're still running data warehouses on-prem, uh, my recommendation is move it to the cloud first. <laughs> uh, I think um, you do uh, want the cloud, you know, the compute and storage separation for having the best of both worlds where, you know, when you do, uh, you know, there is, a, there is like, you know, amazing cloud data warehouses available. So, um, so yes, I think my recommendation would be if you're still on-prem, move, move to the cloud first. Um, the how much of this is relevant? I think I think the most of the talk, if you think about data mutability, uh, how even on-prem you know, warehouses, you know, all are all again using very similar columnar compression. Uh, they don't support secondary indexes. So most of the conceptual, um, uh, you know, things that we talked about in this applies to whether your data warehouse is, is in the cloud or whether your data warehouse is on-prem. Um, but I think the cost factor is probably more pronounced in the cloud, right? The cost explosion that we're talking about uh, because it's a consumption model as opposed to you, you know, purchasing hardware ahead of time where the hardware is fixed and you just, your performance varies. In the cloud, oftentimes your performance is fixed and your, your compute cost varies over time. And you, that's where I think there is a, a bigger danger in the cloud if you do it wrong. But conceptually, if you think about, you know, query performance, uh, query concurrency, uh, data mutability, semi-structured data, a lot of the, the, the you know, the topics we talked about are relevant anytime you're building uh, an application on, on top of a warehouse. Okay, great, thanks. Here's another one for you. So. What would you say is there some type of metric which you would say is the crossover point where a data warehouse makes sense and where Rockset helps? A very good question. I think a rule of thumb is um, look at the compute cost for a particular use case, right? Not for your entire uh, data lake or data warehouse bill, but for a particular use case, take a look at your storage cost and your compute cost. Right, and that's always a, a good indicator when you know you see uh, something like what we saw earlier, where you know you're spending you know ten thousand dollars or to like forty thousand dollars on your compute, but like hundred dollars on your storage, 
uh, I think then there is not a good space time trade off. Uh, another rule of thumb is it's even simpler to think about is are you spinning up compute in your data warehouse or your data lake 24 7? Hmm. If you're spinning up compute 24 7, then you're doing it wrong, right? Then you're not really leveraging the, the, the key benefits of a, a cloud data warehouse. So if you, you know, and, um, and that's when I think you should really start thinking about, well, if I'm going to be spinning compute 24 seven, I might as well go to a system that is a lot more compute efficient. Um, and, and that's a, that's, that's a good uh, time to start thinking about, um, you know, you know, how, you know, how do I leverage, uh, you know, other technologies that can give me better performance at a lower cost. Thanks. Uh, here's one more for you. If I need a warehouse and rock set, how do I configure the two of them together? Yeah, I think it's a great question. See, I think um, a real-time database doesn't remove the need for batch analytics. You still need a warehouse for batch analytics. And you should use a, a good data warehouse for batch analytics because it's a very important, uh, you know, it plays a very important function in an organization, in a business. So, um, so that is absolutely essential. And uh, the the way uh, you know we see in with our customers uh, is really a combination, right? I think you know you have data coming in, and you you have a lot of historical data. You have a lot of um, uh, you know large data sets, you know, just getting parked uh, and and stored in a data lake or a data warehouse, um, and for batch analytics. But there is usually a smaller uh, volume of that data that where Rockset sits alongside your warehouse or, or your or your data lake, um, where you know either it could be a lambda architecture where uh, as new data even streams comes in, it gets drained to both Rockset and and you set up a smaller uh, data retention interval in Rockset where like you know I'm gonna send 100% of the data to Rockset but like keep only the last seven days worth of it. Uh, but you can go and set up a different longer retention on your data lake or data warehouse. So that's a very common way uh, these things are set up. But you could also do it the other way around where everything gets, um, if real time is not important for you, then you could do a very simple architecture where data comes and gets accumulated um, in your data lake, in your data warehouse. And periodically uh, you take uh, kind of like the last step of the ETL process, you know, those, those cleaned up, a golden data set that you really want to give it to every uh, everybody in your in your business teams. You take that out of your warehouse, out of your lake, and and throw it over to a system like Rockset uh, periodically, and then power all your interactive fast analytics on top of that. So so I think both uh, models are, are are valid. Both of both of those uh, allow you to build uh, you know fast interactive analytics on top of large data sets uh, that is a lot more compute efficient and a lot lot faster. Um, but if you need real time, then a Lambda architecture makes sense. Otherwise, you should use Rockset as like your massively scalable, fast serving tier uh, for your analytical applications. Okay, well, thanks, Venkat. Uh, this might be a good place to close. And then if you want to find out more, especially on that last question, right? Uh, Data Warehouse and Rockset working together. We, we have next month's uh, Tech Talk talking about Snowflake and Rockset. So join us for that uh, if you're available. If not, you can register and we'll we'll send you the, the recording in, in any case. And I want to say thanks, Venkat, for being with us today and sharing some of your thoughts from your experiences, you know, in, in past roles and working with uh, the customers that, that we have now. So thanks a lot, Venkat. Thanks, Kevin. And, uh, yeah. It was a pleasure. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you know, find me on LinkedIn, or I'm, uh, you know, I'm venkat at rockset.com. So just email me. I'll love to hear from you. For sure. And then uh, thanks to all uh, those who logged in, registered, attended today. Uh, very good to to see you all turn out, and hope to see you uh, some other time at a Rockset event. Okay. We'll sign off now. Thanks, everyone.